It is the year 1360, Robert de Vere. The year you met the end of your life and the beginning of your unlife at the hands of your sire, Killian Brousseau, the great musician. You remember that night well. The songs and dancing after the London court had ended. It was captivating and invigorating, with a presence like none other. You danced that night like you'd never danced before. So enthralled and drunk on his charisma and joy, you didn't even realize that the two of you had ended up in a room apart from the party before he assailed you with lightning speed, and it was over. Following that night, and him orienting you to your new existence, you would spend the next several years traveling with him abroad, joining him in his acts and songs, inviting the two of you to play together at inns and taverns, making good coin and feasting your way across England, from London to Exeter, up to Anglesey and Wales and then Chester, and from Chester to York, and finally to the city of Lincoln. Your sire spends this time teaching you about unlife, about the courts that you present yourself to at these cities and the princes there. And finally, in 1363, you arrive in Lincoln and are presented to yet another sire, another prince, Jean-Marc de Martinique, your sire's sire, making him your grandsire. How does Robert de Vere handle his adjustment to life, and how does he present himself to his grandsire? He's going to make the most charming attempt that he can in this first meeting. How does he go about making himself more charming? Following a proper etiquette to a T, he will greet his grandsire. Does he perform anything when he arrives? Or does he remain formal? Good question. For now, he will remain formal, and if a sire is curious, he'll sing a song or something for him. Killian does insist that when you get here to your grandsire city, uh, he insists the two of you do perform at court for a number of nights. And this is not a court for the living, but for the dead, for the Canites of this city. You join him? Yes, that sounds very fun. That sounds like something Robert would enjoy greatly. You're a very perceptive individual and very keen on emotional sentiment. Over these nights, even among these creatures, you can tell you are beginning to detect some tension between your sire and your grandsire. You play well enough and you impress the courts well enough. But you realize that your family name and your pull with the kind is brought up in discussion by your sire multiple times throughout the nights. There's certainly some showboating going on and you realize you've not just been brought here for the official presentation or for a good time, but to be put on display as a trophy. How does Robert react to this realization?
He spent a good bit of his life trying to measure up, so he's going to take a little bit of pride in this. All right, you relish the attention then. Your sire certainly seems to. And this all takes place over several nights of more or less partying and and uh, carousing and good times of song and cheer and dance. After which, your grandsire, Jean-Marc de Martinique, invites the two of you to meet with him in his chambers in the great tower in the castle. When you get there, you see that his tower, his chamber, is decadently enshrined with sheer dark blue and black satin silks that hang high and long from the ceilings, which are themselves very high up. And he speaks up to the two of you when you arrive. Guillaume, I am most pleased with your choice to carry my vitae. Robert here will make a fine compliment on my card. Merci beaucoup, monsieur. And he finishes with a wry smile. Killing smile drops as he looks between the two of you. <laughs> my liege, uh, methinks there is some misunderstanding. Robert and I are on tour. We have yet many cities to see and perform. We shall be traveling far abroad for years to come yet. And he, he rests a, a hand on your shoulder, standing side to side with you and facing Jean Marc with you. What does Robert do? Robert raises an eyebrow as he reads this tense situation, smiling politely. He'll... He'll mention, uh, indeed. We have many more places to travel. Your grandsire looks at you. What a pity. I'd already informed Renal to announce the establishing of Belgate as the new domain of yours, Sir Robert. Reynald is holding Elysium as we speak. But years, it is a long time to not tend to one's domain, Robert. Killian is looking at him intensely. Balegate here. You're giving him the district of Balegate. Now they're both looking at you. Is there any way Robert would know anything of this district? You've only been here a few nights, but you know the district of Billgate. It's it's a fairly large neighborhood, uh, fairly well upscale. It's a significant size of domain to just give someone. Robert will look at his sire, Killian, and then back at his grandsire. Perhaps our tour could be put on hold. After all, this does sound like the moment for business. Jean-Marc has a faint smirk as Killian looks at you with disgust and enraged. He takes his hand from your shoulder and begins to leave, stopping at the door. Are you coming with me or staying here? He's going to try and smooth over his sire. He doesn't want to make him angry after all.
Gillian, my sire. I do not wish your departure to be in such ill emotions. Perhaps we can speak of this later. He glares at you from the doorway and then continues onward out of sight. And without any sound, without any realization he was so close to you, your grandsire puts a, a hand on the same shoulder that he was placing a hand on. And he's, he's still got this wry smile, but he's looking towards the door now. Gillian is flighty. Do not worry, he will forget about this. He will return. I can only trust that you know him well. One of the, the blessings and their curse of this clan. His emotion it comes and goes with the tide. I think you will be more happy here. And it tap pats you on the shoulder. Well, it seems I'll have to get accustomed to this place. He nods. The scene ends. Your grandsire grants you a large amount of domain to make haven in and hunt from, as well as draw income from. Your sire, Kellyan, leaves that night in a fit, but he would return from time to time over the next years. And a man is also suggested to you uh, from the staff of Jean Roc's household, Francois de Maison who is supposed to be singularly good with managing affairs of estate and finance. He's been arranged to help you with managing all of your new properties and their incomes, as well as those of your families. Unless you vehemently detest. Or protest, I should say. He does not. He sounds like a fine man to take care of such responsibilities. Francois is a very quiet man, very serious and to the point. He does not joke around, and it seems as though he was previously a ghoul to Jean-Marc, but seems ready to come under your influence well enough. It's not clear how old he is or how long he's been shuffled around like a pawn piece, but it's certainly not something he complains about, however long he's been doing this. With a foothold now in Lincoln, what does Robert DeVere mean to do over the next 20 years? Twenty years? Well... Fifteen to twenty years. If he's going to keep up appearances with his family name, he will. He is at the age where he does need to get married. Um, he will. Do that. Seek a suitable wife. Um, at the same time, he will. Begin having Francois. starts uh, overseeing his new income. All right, Francois is 
solely dedicated to managing the estates, your, your various finances and sources of income, which is quite expansive, quite uh, stretched out, especially between your new holdings and what you already had. He has to work most of his hours and is sleeping when he doesn't. He does not sleep very much. You find only a couple hours every couple days. But he is dedicated to the task nonetheless. How do you want to go about finding a wife for yourself? He will... There, um, hmm. Perhaps there's a court or a local lord in Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Perhaps um, he could put a, a word over in court that he is seeking a suitor. Or whatever the word is for it. Absolutely. There are many ladies in waiting in the major cities, and this is certainly one place that you will find them. I'm not going to have a role for that. There are a, a number of women that you could find, uh, mostly around the ages of 18 to 25 at the latest, at the oldest, I should say. Does Robert go in person to see who is available as these noble and gentry families more or less put on display their their daughters as ladies in waiting he will he'll go in person evaluate everything uh, and also just all around be a charming fellow throughout the whole ordeal make an appearance etiquette difficulty six as you make yourself a charming presence in court I suppose that could count as a three. He does have a specialty in appearance. Let's see. And that is... What is that? Unforgettable face? Yes. I, I will say it. I will say yes in this instance. Your unforgettable face is something that I mean, you're very successful. You're you're pretty successful going into court. You're quite dashing, and you you blend in seamlessly. And it's especially your face that these these nobles and their families and the daughters keep in mind. You have striking features, the features only a vampire truly could have. And because of that, you are particularly successful. You have your pick of the litter, and uh, each of them seem to be. At your, at your arm, at your beck and call. Are you looking for any, in particular, the most attractive or the most witty? Or the youngest or the oldest? I would say primary would be family. How uh, how their status is. The next would be wits, and and then finally appearance. Okay. Give me a wits politics. Go dusting. One success. It seems like they all come from approximately equal, you know, status and influence. Let's see here.
one family stands out that seems to have a bit more connections with the the local Earl, the Earl of Lincoln, and that is the Trudeau family. And there is this the daughter is Caroline Trudeau. She's fairly attractive. You think of average wiles, but certainly her family would have the closest connection of closest to nobility, certainly closest to the Earl of Lincoln. And then what he is looking for, that seems to be the closest fit. Alright. Give me a... Well, let me back up. So you have this... This woman that you are courting. You mean to court her and then marry her? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I will make you roll through all of it. You have plenty enough skill in all that you would need to sufficiently woo her. And these are families that are very much looking for someone like you to take their daughters. So you are successful in courting Caroline Trudeau. the name yeah I'm make sure the name's right and after about a year uh, they ask about a marriage how do you handle that they're planning this big celebration uh, at the church on a uh, noon Sunday and that's the time they plan yes they propose it. They think, you know, maybe next Sunday at noon or this Sunday or the coming Sunday. It's got to be a Sunday, certainly, but... Hmm. Are there times of um, uh, a nightly service, you know, nightly prayers offerings at the cathedral I'll say that there's a midnight mass and it's uh, we'll say once a month once a month in that case Robert will look very much interested in a marriage. He does want to alter the time at the cathedral. At, uh, at after, right after the midnight mass on that special month. He wants this occasion to be grand, he says. He wants to put on a magnificent feast. It's a very strange request, one that's never been heard of before. But, because you are who you are and you're very, you have a very enchanting way about how you present this all, you're very skilled in, in presenting this. They agree to it, although it's quite the queer request. It's, it's kind of exotic and it's kind of exciting that someone wants to do this. And since it is still in a church and after a, a service, it's still quite... You know, it's not sacrosanct or anything. It's not sacrilegious. It's just a bit odd. And so they agree. It's something of a sleepy ceremony. Most people are very much asleep during this time, but it livens up when you uh, begin performing and it ends up being actually quite quite a successful marriage, quite a memorable one 
for its uniqueness. And you take Caroline to your haven within your domain. And she expects to be bedded. As well she should. And Robert uh, is not uh, unknown to the requirements of doing this. And so Robert will indeed consummate this marriage, spending blood to do so. All right. It's uh, a very convincing act. And she seems satisfied with this at the end of everything. She doesn't seem to think anything is odd about this. You're very skilled in mimicking life. And so it seems like existence, life seems to go on well enough. Although in the coming weeks and months, it finds it very odd that you never come out during the day and she begins to ask why. How long has it been thus far? Into the marriage? Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll say it's it's a month before she, you know, she finds you and, and demands to know why you don't attend church in the day, why you don't ever come out during the day, you don't eat food. She's beginning to get very concerned for your health and your soul. She thinks, she wonders if you've taken ill. How do you maintain this charade? Or do you? These... These questions would come up eventually. And he's... loath to... lie to her for this... For this whole... The entirety of her life. So he will, he'll put on a very serious air as he has a conversation with her, you know, take, take her by the hands, lead her down towards the, the bed or couch. And he'll also, knowing that mentioning this could go very, very poorly. He'll use the powers of his blood to use... I'm looking at the ability right now. You want to use Level presence? one presence, yes. Yes. Alright. Go ahead and roll your charisma expression difficulty eight. And you can lower it by your dots and presence for this roll. This won't okay. be an always thing, but in the prelude I do some of this. Three successes. You are surprisingly very successful at what otherwise should have been a very difficult conversation through your gifts and through your natural talent at how you convey news to people, how you how you keep them with you, and how they bear with you. You are able to calmly explain this, and she doesn't panic. She seems scared at some points, but then you reassure her. And then she seems to have doubts, and then you remove them. And at the end, she seems 
accepting, although very sad, very, very dejected, as she realizes the weight of what this means, that she will never have a family, and she will never bear sons, that her, her family will come down on her. She seems not to be angry or frightened at you, but more saddened by all the things this means for her and her family. And does she cry at all? Yes. In the end, she does end up weeping for her own fate, for the fate of her family, and this this dream of a life has just come shattering around her. She doesn't panic, she doesn't fly in a rage or, or flee you, but she seems... It seems like her, her life's goal... She's been promised away to a man who will never, prom will never fulfill any of these things for her. And she's stuck. In that case, Robert will also hug her and weep as well for this deception. It does pain him. Roll your conscience in this moment. Difficulty eight. You find it is a regrettable loss. It's one that you, you share in her pain. It makes you reattach yourself to the life that you were trying to leave behind, but it's really not that far behind you right now. She seems to appreciate your commiseration. It, it lightens the burden somewhat, but it seems to add to yours. Time continues to pass on. Will you let her age as she uh, continues by your side obediently? She's not a ghoul at all yet. She's not under the blood. She seems entirely wrapped around you only by your words and her commitment as a wife and to her family as a daughter. Mm-hmm. Um, he'll, he'll actually, well, he, sus he, he suspects he would know the answer, but he'll gauge her feelings on this. Does she wish to stop aging as he does? It's very quick. No, she does not, I'm, or rather, she does not want to be become like you. She does want to age. She wants to live a normal life. That's what she always wanted, and it's being stolen from her in, in large pieces here and there. She does not want to take your blood or become this unaging creature like you. She doesn't want any of it. In that case, he'll offer up a recommendation of adopting a child. In private or in public? Because right now, adoption, especially for people in your class, is not something that happens. Noble families procreate and join. It, it definitely would have to be in private. She, you know, she explains to you, and you realize people will expect to see her pregnant. They will expect to see. You know, midwives will expect to see a birth. Will you have her bedded by someone else? Is that a suggestion she has made, or...? She brings it up meekly, and then uh, seems to regret bringing it up. 
You, you this she does. Her. Robert studies her silently at that mention. And you catch, I mean, you're very perceptive, and you've known her well enough now that you can tell it's it was it was a slip of the tongue. She wants a family. She wants children. And if there's even a chance that could still happen, even if it's by another man, she wants it to happen. Hmm. Robert frowns as he thinks to himself. It awfully would be cruel to deny her this. He thinks perhaps uh, his goal's anatomy still works. Francois? Yes, Francois. It absolutely does. You bring this up to him? Sure. I'll bring it up to him. Gauge his reaction. He looks at you incredulously. This man is in his, apparently in his 50s. Who knows how old he really is? And he begins to, you can tell just like by the look of his face. He's not sure why you want to do this at all. But since he is your ghoul, he agrees to do as you need. And he'll also question Francois's family history, where he comes from. I don't think he's ever asked. Francois tells you that his family has been dead a very long time and that Jean-Marc has taken care of him and kept him in Lincoln under his uh, servitude and protection for a very long time. He's not very specific. This will make Robert very interested. He'll, he'll ask what his parents were like. What Francois's parents were like? Yes. They were... No one. They were dirt poor farmers in central France. It just so happened that Jean-Marc came across him after his parents had died and took the boy with him back to England let him age here and there and, and made use of him as he needed. He'll, Robert will listen very attentively to the conversation. Francois seems he does not wish to... This doesn't seem like he wants to speak on it at very great length. He's very vague. Even when you press him. Robert will then just... joke about how secretive he is about... He is being about this whole conversation. He doesn't joke very well. He doesn't laugh at all. It's very awkward. In that case, I'll just lightly slap him on the back and laugh at his own jokes. <laughs> and... He'll get up looking like he's reached a conclusion, conclusion and
He'll agree that Francois should go through with this. He agrees too, and your wife seems thrilled. That happens, and uh, as expected, not long after your wife is with child, there's much ado at court. There's you know, great excitement. So you hear, although you're missed, people continue to ask why you don't come to court, why you don't come out. Really, you've become quite the infamous recluse among the, the gentry. At this, uh, Roberts will just consider throwing a, an evening meal to celebrate the birth of this baby, or the expected birth. Absolutely. We'll uh, go with charisma. Let me go a couple ways. This you can go charisma performance to put on. A very nice feast, very festive. Standard. It's a wild success. Everyone loves your parties. You're, you're the odd, eccentric noble who seems to have come from nowhere and holds all of his festivities at night but when they happen everyone loves them and everyone loves you and you're you're, you're just so likable that uh, everyone seems to shut up about the whole thing for a while and so time goes on your quote unquote child is born and your your wife seems very pleased with this and soon enough you're helping to raise a child your grandsire, the prince, asks you why you're going through all the trouble of creating this facade and creating this this false family that you certainly can't keep up forever. He seems to watch with as much amusement as intrigue. To his grandsire, he'll mention that While he does enjoy many aspects of his new life, he does feel robbed of this particular experience. And so he just wants to immerse himself and experience it in its fullest. Your sire visits over the next six, eight years, and uh, he seems to, much as your grandsire expected, he seems to have softened his mood. He still seems somewhat bitter that you have gotten far more domain than he was ever given for some reason, and despite that, he seems happy for you, that you found some connection to the kind, and that you seem to have found your, your place in this world, which that, that seems at times is very bleak and ten years pass your child grows up your wife ages some is now 30 do you continue to try and be a father to this child do you tell them the truth or do you maintain the facade Are you questioning just the child the child yeah do you tell hmm. and what do you name your child it's a boy, by the way. He'll he'll name his child. Uh, yeah, he'll name him Robert. Robert Devere the second. Yes. Nice.
And you say he's what, 10 years old now? He's 10 years old. It's around 1370 ish. I mean, uh, yeah, 1370. He is still too young to be told about this, I believe. Um, he'll he'll wait till his son is older, and then he'll he'll break the news to him. What kind of father? Is Robert DeVere? Is he a taskmaster or is he loving and kind? He's he's only a, awake at night, which makes it quite difficult for a growing young boy. Beyond the years of when he was a baby, but he'll he'll be supportive. He'll he'll teach his son um, the things he was taught, a little of the blade, but he'll put more of an emphasis on actual studies. He'll make the lad. He'll he'll see if the lad takes well to studies. Roll your wits alertness, difficulty 9. Alright, one success. There's a night when your son comes down into your part of the manor and by this point he's gotten quite used to you only come you only wake up at night it's kind of explained that you do do all of your work during the night and you work during the day it's not really something he questions at all but he's coming down and he has this candle and he's in such an excitement that he wants to show you that he runs up to you and he and he just brings it right up to your face and it's close enough that it almost burned you. It almost actually caught you on fire, but you backed away at the last moment. But your fangs do come out at the last moment. You aren't fully able to prepare yourself for this. And you frighten your son, and he drops the candle. It creates a big fire, and it has to be put out. It's a big, it's a big, terrible night. And at the end of it, he seems afraid of you. He sticks close to Caroline, your wife. And uh, she seems to not know what to tell him. What do you tell him? He's still 10 years old? Yes. Hmm. Well then, younger than he wanted to, but he'll. Hmm. Man, this is quite the trouble. Man. Raising kids as a vampire is not not that uh straightforward. No, it is not. Wow. Um. And he absolutely saw the fangs. Man. Okay. Yep. He's terrified. He'll... He'll... He'll try to 
calm his son down, showing that he has no fangs. So open well, your mouth. Yeah, he'll he'll op- he'll open his mouth and show that there's no fangs. No, he'll he'll try to get him to calm down first. So you want to calm him down and then basically lie to him and tell him you didn't see anything. Hmm. No, we're not going to go that far, but. At first, we're going to just calm him down. Okay. Go with a manipulation empathy difficulty 8. It's difficult, but you're able to do it. It's he won't leave his mother's side. He's he's afraid of getting near you. But after after some time of being in the same room and seeing that you're not going to eat him, uh, he seems willing to uh, at least leave his mother's side again. And how what do you how do you go about the next step? He'll give the lad a hug and. And tell him that he must keep a secret what he saw this night with him for the rest of his life. And and hopefully he'll the son will uh, agree to keep such a secret. He seems reluctant to hug you. It's more like you have to hug him, and and he seems to still be trembling a little bit when you say this to him, and he kind of nods to you nervously. Does it not seem like it's going to be true at all? It seems like he's calm, but things are different now. Yeah. Yeah. For what it's worth, he nods to you. He seems to agree to keep your secret. In that case, he'll he'll watch him closely, you know, studies and all. At least whatever studies he can get in right before he has to go to sleep. But he'll he'll definitely keep a close eye on his son now. Okay. Let me think about that. So a few weeks go by and he's still distant from you. He does what he's told. He studies hard. He doesn't talk to you as much now. He doesn't seem as excited or gleeful to see you when he does see you. Standoffish. And then... Your wife reports that she's She's heard some rumors from the other gentry, from the other wives of, of nobility, because a lot of your children go to the same tutors, and there's, you know, coming down the grapevine, kind of hear a lot of the similar things in court and among the same circles. She's telling you that there is a rumor going around that the other children are afraid of your child because of something he's been telling them. And now it's starting to sound like the story's gotten out and your son told someone who told a parent one of these gentry and it 
it's it's starting to alienate her from other circles, other social circles. These rumors. Okay. In that case, um, he needs to learn more about the rumors, and import importantly, he needs to speak with his son to see what he has been saying. A little bit of investigation. It, it does seem like most of the gentry, families of the courts, many of the people you were holding these feasts for, they've all been told the same thing, that you have fangs that you can make, like you're a monster in disguise, or a monster with the skin of a man. There's a few different variations, but it's, it all comes back to that. And when you do sit your son down to talk about this, he's he's terrified. You can tell that he's he's still terrified of you, and uh, you can't get a straight answer out of him. Well, he should be. He lied. I suppose he never taught him the importance of a, a promise. Hmm. He is going to... going to need to think of something elaborate. Is there anyone being particularly loud about this rumor? No one in particular. No one wants to be loud about it. It doesn't help anyone if there are these rumors floating about that the gentry of Lincoln have a devil worshiper or a monster in their midst or something of that kind. And it's getting to the point where even your grandsire is starting to ask what you're going to do about this. Of course. Who is the um, the archpriest of the cathedral? Like the Archbishop of Lincoln? Yes. The Archbishop of Lincoln is Henry Porter. Henry Porter. In that case, um, Robert will schedule to meet this... Uh, this man after a, uh, the midnight mass, so similar to his wedding. Actually, he wouldn't be an archbishop. He'd just be a regular bishop, but all the same. Oh, bishop. Okay. Yeah, Bishop of Lincoln. So you want to schedule a meeting with him? Yeah, let's, let's schedule a meeting with him. Where? Does he have a residence that's near the cathedral? He has a manor, yeah, that's not far from the cathedral. And he'll recommend that manor. He invites you to an afternoon snack after the Sunday service. And this is during the Midnight Mass? No, this is afternoon. After after a Sunday service in the afternoon. No, but this was proposed to him during the Midnight Mass? Well, this is kind of, you know, 
in between messages go back and forth he hears that you want to meet with him and it's scheduled and you hear back from him that this is when he wants to meet it kind of happens over a period of nights okay okay that's how it goes um hmm, at noon no oh, afternoon but yeah Robert will think about um, the communion uh, and see if he can get like a, a nice gift for the priest. Um, like, uh, does he use a special type of wine or something? Uh, they have a. They kind of have like this this contract with a vineyard that pro that produces a uh, wine for them. Do they know? Yeah, it's it's not like anything special. There's nothing odd or unique about it. Do you agree to his invitation? He would much rather Meet. Uh, uh, he'll tell the the priest to come to. He should come to his manor for lunch. For lunch in the middle of the day. Yes, at noon, in a place where there's no sunlight. Okay, and just to make sure that you're aware, you you know that to stay awake during the day is very difficult, right? Oh, I'm aware. Okay. All right. He seems pleased with this and agrees to meet you. He comes over during one of these weekdays for lunch. Oh, and before before he actually comes over, I want to hear from Francois how things are going in the financial department. It hasn't been very long uh, in you know time scale of things. It's Things are going fine right now. It's a lot to keep up with, but as long as he's really just dedicated to that, it's he's able to stay on top of it. It's he has to work around the clock to keep on top of it, but it's it seems like your finances are holding without any problems right now. All right. He will want to procure a gift for the church to show his piety. Like a of what size? of a something that the the man would be willing to talk about like maybe a new addition to the cathedral all right like a new like a new room or a building added on to it or something sure that sounds yeah that sounds good a new room okay that's going to be a pretty significant investment, but not necessarily out of your realm. It's going to be difficult. I'll have you roll your resources difficulty 8. This is on the upper end of what you can spend without actually giving up some of your resources here. You pull it off. Your, you know, the quarter that you happen to need this is actually a fairly good quarter for you. And you have the funds, if only barely, to pull this uh, very extravagant gift off. And it's well received by the bishop. And, you know, he, you get a message back. He's, he's very... He's very grateful for your donation to the church, and he's looking forward to lunch with you. Good. Okay, now, on the day of your lunch, you 
are going to need to stay awake for a long time when you normally would not be able to. So I'll need a, a willpower roll. We'll go with difficulty... Mm, difficulty 8. Do you tell your wife or anyone else about this plan, or you just go for it? Oh, uh, he'll mention that he's inviting the bishop over, and of course he'll he'll in a playful way he'll gauge her reaction. She seems uh, astounded. She's never seen you awake during the day. She didn't think it was possible from your explanation, and is is worried about this. She asks you how you're going to do it, if she needs to be there, what happens if something goes wrong. She's very concerned. He, he'll mention that it's very likely that he could pass out during this meeting, and he would appreciate her there to explain that he indeed is sick. And he fears for his soul. That's why he donated that new wing of the cathedral. And have you been feeding from her or hiding your feeding? How have you handled that? He has not been feeding from her, no. Okay. But you explain the process, yes? He has explained explained it. Okay. Okay. She agrees to this. She uh, begrudgingly agrees to this. Roll your perception, empathy, difficulty eight. What's your empathy specialty? Oh, no. Er, it was, um... I forget the exact wording. But it was, uh, finding out the truth or something. Okay. I'm gonna give you three successes on that. You get a roll to ten. You've definitely known her long enough, and you're definitely perceptive enough that she is anxious. She's thinking about something. She's not saying what. She's agreeing to your plan. But there's something that she's not willing to say right now. Hmm. In that case, Robert will pry. He'll try to... He'll say... He, he's noticed some reservation... that she could tell him anything. Eventually she re relents to you that she thinks that perhaps this bishop can save your soul. That perhaps you should come clean about what you are and that maybe it can be fixed. That perhaps you could be normal again and they, this can all be normal. Surely, through God's grace, this can be fixed. Robert will... Robert will think on this um, for a moment, but at last he'll say, as far as he knows, there is no cure, just as Cain from the Bible had to carry his mark with him. That this curse was now 
a part of him and will most likely remain until Judgment Day. You explain this to her and she seems to understand your reservations. But by the end of the night, you still get the feeling that she has hope that something could be done. And she has anxiety about this meeting and might try something. Robert really hopes she doesn't. He's going to hope that he can just... Hmm. 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 Well, Francois is quite busy at the moment, isn't he? He is. He's extremely busy. You never see him. And when you do see him, he's just working. He has many of these page boys and clerks working for him nonstop. You have many assets to manage. All right. Do you let the night end with the? He's lunch? going. He's going. He's going to. Um, no, he's not just going to let the night end like that. He's going to go back to Caroline and explain to her that it's the it's the utmost importance that she speak only what we've discussed for if not, there's a very good chance, if not by the bishop, the others who carry this curse would hunt him down and he would not be able to see little Robert reach adulthood. She agrees. She seems to be placated with this. She seems to believe you when you say that this is of the utmost importance, that nothing else should be said. The anxiety you sense is gone. Robert will fully look relieved and give her a kiss on the lips for good night. It is late and she falls asleep as well. Uh, you're not too far behind as day comes. But uh, it sounds like you are going to try and wake up or try and stay up into noon, aren't you? Yes, he's going to have to try and stay awake just just a little bit, bit past noon. Roll your humanity difficulty 8. You need a total of 5 successes to stay awake. And is this... Um... Is it an extended roll, or...? It, it's total. You don't have to get it all at once. You just need to not fail. Okay. Difficulty 8. Oh my goodness. Yep. You cannot spend willpower during pre -lead. Oh, you can't at all? Okay. No, not at all. <laughs> okay, let's do this.
no successes. You are unable to fight against the curse. The sun rises and you are asleep in your chair. You don't know what happens, but I'm going to make some rolls. And then you're going to find out what is, happens. Is there like a way to perception awake? If like, something attacks you, yeah. Comes, the time comes. Just attack or... If something stirs, yeah. It's um, perception... Was it perception? If you have aspects, you can roll that too. But uh, we'll get to that. Hold on. Okay. Let's see how your wife is at lying. Okay. Ty goes to the defender in this case, the that, person being that's lied so to. Lucky. That's so lucky. Uh, not for you. Oh yeah, true. Oh well. You, your wife is almost, almost sells this. I gotta think about what happens next and what do you perceive next. Give me a moment. Yeah, give me a perception plus your road difficulty eight. This is for stirring. Okay. Okay. You're not awake for the scene or anything. You wake up for a moment it's it's not a clear picture to you your your eyes flutter open for just a few moments and then they're shut and then they open again you only get pictures you hear shouting and see that Bishop Henry Porter is in your home he's got his hand raised to you he's shouting and you can you can hear your wife in the background and then your your eyes shut it goes black and then you don't know how long passes but you your eyes flutter open and you you can hear screaming somewhere but you don't know where and then your eyes shut again it's blackness they open again fluttering open you see you're not you're not in your home anymore you're being dragged somewhere up a circular stone tower it's rough it's just stone bricks you're going up and up you don't know where you're being dragged and then your eyes shut finally you awaken again and you are awake. It must be evening. It must just have turned evening. You're, you're awake and you're alert. It's not hard to stay awake now. And you are not in your home. You are in what appears to be the servant's chamber of someone. And you see a man you've seen before. You're familiar with him. Reynald Rui, the ghoul and the seneschal of the prince, Prince Jean Marc. His seneschal is, in fact, a mortal. And you've met him. He doesn't say much. He's a very curt man, a loyal bloodhound. And he's keeping you company in this small servant's room. 
His arms are folded. He's he's wearing armor. Not quite as much armor in this picture, but he has chainmail on. There's a blade at his side. And his hands are bloody. Robert will instantly jump up and question Renald what happened he's silent he unfolds his arms and opens the door to leave the chamber and it's not long after that he re-enters with the prince, Prince Jean Marc. Robert, I am most displeased to hear what has happened. Robert hangs his head in shame. That you really think that you could uh, invite a bishop? into your home in the middle of the day and that there would be no problem to your thinking I underestimated my strength I could not even stay up in the slightest It's not a but, Robert. You want to judge all of our kind. I... When old, he had the most regrettable duty of cleaning up your mess. And Robert will look at the blood questioningly. Grandsire, tell me, what has happened? He has a grim look on his face. Tonight, my dear Robert, you must learn a very painful lesson of this in life. But eventually you must cut all connection those who still live around you who cannot maintain this facade without the tragedy such as this one and Robert's mind is darting to the meaning behind these words and he, he starts shaking his head no 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 is, is Caroline still alive? Is my son? He maintains a grim look, the both of them looking at you. Reynald's arms folded again. I am very sorry, Robert, that this is what you must endure to learn. And Robert is just completely silent. If he could go in shock, he probably would have. But he is just waiting motionless for the news. You can see your grandsire's face softens a bit. Reynald could not let anyone out alive. Their home, it is gone. He shakes his head. It will take me considerable resources to uh, 
cover up the loss of the bishop. If it were anyone else, Robert, I would have burned that house down with you inside. But you... I believe that you have greater potential. It will not be wasted. And I know that I can trust you after this night. Robert nods as blood begins to pool in his eyes. Cursing himself the whole while. Cursing his foolishness. Jean-Marc turns and ushers Reynald out, and the two of them leave. You find in the coming nights that you are a... a guest that may not leave the tower, this castle, which Jean-Marc seems to have in the uh, in the city of Lincoln. But even from the tower, you can see the smoke from where your manor once was. It's explained to you weeks later that your death was explained away in this fire, that there was a very tragic fire involving an oven that was poorly constructed, leading to flames getting too high, and the manor collapsing in, taking out the entire family, and the bishop inside. And Robert, he just simply shakes his head in acknowledgement. He spent too much time just, just crying, just absolutely depressed. It turns out you are not allowed to leave that tower for another year as Jean-Marc comes up with a new identity for you. Of course, your face is far too recognizable. No one can see you here, at least not for now, not as the way you look. Great resources are put into creating a new identity for you. Documents are drawn up. At the year's end, you uh, have an identity, but there are still far too many people who know who you are. And Jean-Marc sends you with uh, a carriage of some of your belongings and some of the coin that is yours. He sends you north to the city of York as a favor from the prince there where you will not be known. How is Robert taking all this? At this point, he's... He feels utterly defeated more than he has in his whole life. He's going through the motions, but he can still manage enough politeness to thank his grandsire for all he's done for him. And that 
he will be certain to pay back pay him back the new name Neil go ahead and he'll also um, before he goes because he suspects he won't see his his own sire for quite some time he'll uh I'll just uh, ask his grandsire to tell his sire he's sorry. He agrees. Indeed, your sire has been frequently traveling. He's gone for this event, but it's promised he'll get the message. The plan is that you will spend... at least the next 20 years in York that you may not return to Lincoln for at least that long and that you will be indebted a major boon not to the Prince of Lincoln but in fact the Prince of York Hmm. Robert figures he should get to know this chap. You learn that it's actually not a chap. It's a woman by the name of Ragna. Ragna of York is apparently some kind of friend to your grandsire, or at least perhaps some boon was owed, and she seemed willing to take in another neonate. So you're presented, and of course you likely go through the motions without any anything behind it at all, perhaps still dealing with the, the trauma Ten years pass by, how does Robert intend to spend this time now in the city of York? Well, he has quite a bit of time now. Um, he'll keep uh, his ear to the ground for what the prince wants. Um, but most of his time will be spent connecting with uh, the other kindred of the city. Um, spending time in Elysium. Uh, and he'll also, he'll also spend his nights going to um, to mingle amongst the amongst the humans um, uh, perhaps at bars or taverns perhaps he'll um, he'll get a following that's good he could bring back with him whenever his in his mind exile is over with Roll your charisma etiquette, standard difficulty. You're very successful at blending into this city. As troubled as you are by your past, you do know how to mingle in Elysium and make friends. Overall, you are well received, and you seem to fit fairly well into the courts here. 
Ragna seems to certainly uh, be pleased with you at least. In the year 1381, you hear that the lower class is at the worst it's ever been. It's overtaxed and frail, and you see for yourself some of this. It's battered by plague and strife. The lower class tries to recover as the Hundred Years' War further depletes the country of men and resources. And this tension results in the Peasants' Revolt, and London, you hear, has become very dangerous for the upper class and forces the king into the Tower of London, supposedly. What's Robert's sentiment towards this, if any at all? Sentiment towards this is... England has come under hard times and sacrifices must be made during this time. It is unfortunate that the peasants are going through so much strife, but he doesn't, he doesn't see anything wrong with the established order. I should also mention, I don't think I said before, your new identity at least so far as York is concerned, is Gautier Lacan. You type that on Discord? Mm-hmm. Mostly for the mortals who ask... Ragnus seems to know who you are. It's up to you whether you say this to any of the canines in the city. Although you realize it would probably hurt your status there. To mention my real name? To mention the reason you have to be here under a false name. Aha. Uh -huh. Hmm. In that case, um... He realizes this will hurt his status. But at this point, he's, he's very penitent about this whole thing, and he can only see this as something he has to overcome. So he'll he'll mention his story that he made horrible mistakes in his early years. Most seem to commiserate having their own stories of regrets they made when they were fledglings. Or even now some of the Ancilla you managed to get a few words of commiseration, though they seem a little bit more reticent to say anything. Another ten years passes, fairly uneventfully. Do you intend to do anything more in this city before you return to Lincoln during this time? Or just kind of build good rapport with the, the locals? Well, has he been working towards paying the spoon back at all? She hasn't this... called upon it. Okay. She hasn't even mentioned it. That must be something for the future. You're aware by mm. now that some canids, especially elders, may hold boons for many years before they call upon them. You're not sure how old Ragna is, but she doesn't seem to be worried that you're going to dip out on it. He'll send, um, he'll send letters to Francois asking him how things are going. 
you receive letters back from him reporting that he's been able to maintain your resources in your absence that it's been continuously difficult especially with the loss of the manor that created some challenges for him logistically and legally but he's managed to circumvent most of it he says nothing about the loss of his child Robert thinks to himself that he'll have to speak with Francois in person at some point. But for now, yeah, he'll uh, just keep a good rapport uh, with uh, the kin or yeah, kindred of York and. He'll look for he'll look for um more companions amongst the mortals in here. Um maybe even another ghoul. All right. What kind of companions are you looking for? Hmm. 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 Let's say, uh, hmm, merchants, traders. Yeah. Do you want to make uh, friends with a, a merchant? Yeah. Any merchant at all? Well, he'll uh, go to the markets and look uh, look around. If anything like really catches his eye, maybe, maybe even. Well, I don't know if merchants would even sell books, but books are extremely rare. Yeah, I figure they would be. There is a in all of London. There are two bookstores there is one bookstore in York it's very high end he's going to Sure, he'll make he'll make friends with uh, this book merchant, and he'll occasionally come by, see what's if there's any anything uh, any new poetry out. Um, he'll also perhaps study. Uh, he'll study in the meantime as well, perhaps. All right, you find it's difficult to get this man's attention in the evenings. He really only operates during the day, but with enough persistence and certainly time you have plenty of, you manage to catch him, and given your aptitude at social situations, especially with the kind, you quickly make friends with him, especially when you start quoting poetry to him, and you find a kindred spirit, so to speak. He's certainly more learned than you. He seems as much an academic as much as, as an academic as a merchant. And he's, he shows and shares with you some of his more favored literature, which gives you quite a bit to read. Uh, making friends with the only book, book merchant in town has the perks of having a great deal to study and becoming learned on the classics. And you can go ahead and give yourself a dot of academics over this 10 years as you study. All right. He deserves to have a name. 
and his name is Albert Duran, the book merchant. You mean to ghoul him as well? Nah. He seems like he's happy with his bookstore. Mm hmm. Definitely. He's currently in his 40s right now. He'll probably be around another 10 years, perhaps. In case you should decide to visit him. So that this time ends and you are invited back to Lincoln. Of course, under the new identity of Gautier Lacan. And Robert will go along a nostalgic trip around the Lincoln at night. And he, but uh, his first stop will be back at his grandsire to keep up on the news. Surprisingly, despite your major faux pas, your grandsire seems happy to see you. And you are welcome back quite graciously. You become aware through speaking with your grandsire that he's participating in the establishment of something a new organization of powerful Canite princes that call themselves the Covenant, which he is a part of. And this group seems to promise some sense of stability for England in the wake of the death of Adam, once the Canite Lord of England. And this collection of elders effectively comes to rule all the lands and towns of England by proxy of the lesser princes and smaller vassal fiefs, like Exeter in the south and Anglesey, places you've been. Jean-Marc de Martinique is one among seven of the Covenant. And you notice, and he explains to you, that at times he must leave the city for a few weeks or months, about once a decade, for these meetings with the other councillors. In fact, when you return, he is actually fresh from returning from a meeting, and it is in the, let's see, it is now the 1390s, and you meet a man by the name of Gaetan de Corvo, an enterprising merchant, and apparently belonging to something called the Gauntlet, which is some kind of outreach of the Governant, and... Through your proximity to your grandsire, you find out that Gaetan has become his lover as well. And they seem to always be in each other's company when Gaetan visits. He'll be uh, welcoming towards this man. Gaetan seems well enough of a man to you. He certainly treats you with respect, but you, he has a little bit of an uppity air to him. And as the two of them spend time together, roll your wits politics difficulty 8. Wow, you're very successful. You are very wily. You deduce that Gaetan is more than just a member of the Gauntlet, and more than just Jean-Marc's lover. They're being very discreet about it, but they're... they have some kind of business partnership together as well. Through overhearing things and finding ledgers and documents in your grandsire's chambers, it suggests they're pooling resources for something significant, although it's not clear what yet. 
you are aware that Gaetan is a merchant of great repute, but that's not really your forte. And this is over years, you realize that they're working on something. And how, uh, how uppity is Gaetan? No more than the average blue blood. He has that air of aristocracy which seems to expect a certain level of respect. I'm thinking Robert will want to respectfully go to his grandsire and just for his own sake start a competition against this merchant what kind of competition oh he wants to he wants to go to his grandsire and figure out what they're doing and send see if he could help in his own way and with the end goal of being more helpful than Gaetan. ah so you I mean, it's, it's very clear that what you stumbled upon is not something your grandsire meant for you to like see or find out. But do you go to him with this anyway? He'll, uh... Yeah, it's, I mean, it's not like he's actively spying. He'll, he'll go up uh, polite and just... I'm noticing these strange coincidences, so... Is there anything I could do to help? Roll your charisma expression difficulty eight. It's not a botch, it's just not a success. Your grandsire and Gaetan feign ignorance over what you're speaking about, and it's waved away as a, you know, a minor trade contract that they were going over, even though you know in your mind they've been working on this for years now. Then Robert will put on his best sad face and and be as dramatic about it as possible that well, if you don't want to tell me, fine, I'll drop it. Can you make this a performance roll? I was just thinking, make it a manipulation performance difficulty eight. Okay. Give you another shot. Piss. They're not buying it and they continue with their ignorance, their facade. At least you're not yelled at. Always look on the bright side. Right. So you avoid the ire, your grandsire, in this, and they continue to work secretively. Meanwhile, the Hundred Years' War rages on the longbow becoming the premier English weapon against the French and the Scottish, the latter of whom seem to have retained their independence for now. The plagues and war continue to weaken England. Does Robert have any concern for the war? He's actually... 
He's actually wondering if his father is still alive or if his brother took over your, the earldom. Your father died quite some time ago in the war. You think your brothers were probably in the war, but it's it's been far too long now. It's been... 30 years at least. Maybe 40. Whichever is the current... Um, well, the heir that took over the estate. He's going to go to their old, his old family estate, which is over in... Well, is he, is he freely able to leave Lincoln? You can leave Lincoln under the guise of Gautier Lacan. Okay. You're forbidden from taking up your name again. You can't have ghosts. Thinking of the implications of this, does this mean going over to his previous family and and they somehow recognize him. Could he... Because I'm sure they're quite involved in the war. Could he funnel funds to them? And... With them, like, knowing that they've seen his face, but... It's secretive. You can. It's just a bit risky. Hmm. And they're in Essex, I believe. Yep. Thinking about this, Robert's Robert's mind is going over this. After what happened to a wife and child, I don't think he wants to really play with lives to that extent. But maybe he'll. Maybe they'll come up to. Uh, the servants over there and figure out if the Lord has had any children. Well, that's simple enough to find out. It won't require any rules. You find out that your family name is well and alive and still maintains a household in Essex and the current holder, the current patriarch of your house does have a family. And how old would the next generation be? The current patriarch is in his 60s and his son is in his 30s. Okay. okay. And his son is about 10. He'll go to Well, first he he's going to have to I probably should have specified this sooner, but he's going to have to figure out how much he can actually contribute to any sort of war effort or um whatever conscription techniques would be used maybe give food for the or supply food for the army or whatnot but um he's going to he's going to form a a business deal with uh the 30 year old if he gets the opportunity to okay i can tell you on the resource front you're gonna be pretty tight you're doing well enough on your own but doing things like funding armies you don't have the income size to do anything of significance there. Not without more resources. Uh, as far as starting mm -hmm. a business, what kind of business do you want to start? Hmm. This peasant revolt, is it... Uh... What are some of the main complaints that have started it? Just poverty? 
they're overtaxed. There is a great imbalance of the classes. You know, the upper class enjoy a lot of better hygiene, better food, better everything. So there's the taxation, there's the work. You know, they have to do more work, but with the plagues, there's fewer people, so they're not paid anymore. They want to be paid more. Hmm. So mostly taxes and pay, it all comes down to money. Since the patriarch is 60 years old, it's probably safe to say he doesn't have too much time left. Probably not. So with this, this younger generation, he's going to... If he can meet with them, that's great, and they would. He would talk about uh, a business proposal, something that would increase uh, attraction to Essex, and maybe get a stronger uh, labor economy going. And perhaps these laborers could also be brought in to the war. And it would always impress the king to have more men on the field from Essex. You can try. You're, you know a little bit about commerce, but you're certainly no merchant. It's, it's not the kind of thing that you'd be able to really make a living off of with your knowledge. Although you do know that Francois, I mean... Commerce is his bread and butter. Right now, he's managing your assets. Mm -hmm. He could be utilized in a different way. It would just risk the oversight of your own uh, current assets to expand. So ultimately, what it boils down to is, if you wanted to, you could include Francois, and it could lead to more resources, but at the risk of losing resources, almost a gamble. Because as long as he's solely focused on maintaining your very diverse assets across multiple cities now, it's fine if that's all he's doing. If he starts to do more than that, then it gets a bit shaky. Okay. Well, um... Robert, like you said, Robert does have some skill in commerce. He is he is uh, definitely willing to unburden some of that load for Francois and to see this uh, new venture go through. All right. So first, let's start with the meeting. You want to meet with the patriarch? Not the patriarch. The patriarch's son. Okay. And the goal is... The goal is to make a business opportunity. Um, let's see. So um, he would be looking to buy land uh, over in Essex. to prop up hmm, what would be the main thing driving the economy I guess agriculture that's a good question and it kind of segues us into the change of the economy uh, roll your hmm, let's see economy isn't really your forte you would know you would be able to know though um the general gist. The economy shifted significantly, and it's we're, we're all basically up to 1400, the, the turn of the 15th century. The workflor the workforce is depleted. Agriculture is unprofitable. The the old tried and true wool market is not good. All the men have died from plague or going to war, and so agriculture is unprofitable as the price for labor is increasing. Instead of wool, the manufacture and trade of cloth textiles has become dominant. 
and shipbuilding and the trading of ships like the COG is the single greatest point of investment because of trading fleets. The mining of tin and iron and lead is on the rise and fishing fleets are still profitable. They more or less always have been during this time. And with the exception of York, the eastern ports and the northern lands of England are stagnating. They're growing poorer in the north, while the southern lands grow richer. They're more dense in textile manufacturing. The south is more dense in trade and academia. And the western port of Bristol is becoming very active with imports of cheap goods from Ireland, exports to Iceland. These are the big changes that are that merchants are talking about that you'd be aware of. Okay. Um, there is a port in Ex Essex, uh, mm -hmm. Robert Wood. Remember, is there any trade over there? Maybe with uh, yes, the Flemish. Yeah, Colchester is the main town. It's a major market center and a port. There is absolutely trade. That would be a good place to start in Essex if you wanted to do investing in trade ships or anything like that. Okay, okay. It sounds like a promising start. Uh, Robert sees no reason why he would not attempt to get in on this trade, especially of textiles. Um, All right then. Yeah, he'll uh, he'll bring the proposal forth. Uh, you no know, fair enough split. Just both sides need to come up with uh, the money to get the merchant vessels, and hopefully this will take off and bring more attraction to Essex as well. Okay. So to make this you know a successful meeting, just like they're on your side and they're talking about business and not just who you are and where you came from mm -hmm. roll your we'll go with charisma expression again um, standard difficulty is fine uh, we'll make it seven okay All right, you're fairly successful this meeting, and to clarify, you're you're still you're staying under the guise of uh, Gautier Lacan. Correct. Okay. They agree to meet with you, and it seems it's a fairly successful meeting. You know, you build rapport with them very quickly, as is your talent. And uh, when they get down to brass tacks, they they talk to you about your ideas. They think they're great ideas. Um, and I'm assuming that you did bring Francois along for these meetings? Yes, he'll bring him along and he'll even offer to uh, start up a trade relation with uh, the Flemish in particular. Okay. So, the De Veres, you find you're talking to your, you know, your family, your lineage descendants really mm -hmm. distant nephews uh, not so different distant nephews actually um, of course I don't know who you are they talk to you and uh, Francois and a little bit of it goes above, over your head but you're able to track pretty close on what they're talking about and you get the impression that although they like your ideas they've tried some of it and they've been blocked there are these guilds forming, these chartered trading companies, which are dominating the markets. They're swallowing up smaller enterprises like you're trying to start and conglomerating them into their own. And they have vast networks. They have vast trading fleets. They've bought up many similar endeavors and enterprises like yours and like the one they used to have. 
largely this is done by one singular titanic trading charter trading company called the Worshipful Company of Mercers. This one company, this one guild, seems to be dominating the trade scene, especially in textiles. And Francois tells you he's heard intimidating things about their practices. They're very aggressive and very protective about their trade. Hmm. So they're very aggressive of buying up everything that gets started? Mm hmm They offer up contract offers which are very attractive. You know, most people are willing to get out of business if they can just get coin and they don't have to work for it anymore. Others, when they refuse, they have things happen to them. Not violence per se, but you know, they find the people they work for, their contractors start turning away from them. They find their their fees for docking ships go up suddenly. Their trades are no longer secure. They suffer more piracy. Things that hurt their bottom line. It's It seems like really unfortunate economic coincidences start happening when they turn down the company of mercers. I see. And that's asking Francois, how possible would it be to at least get uh, this going up and would we see a return if it did somehow get bought out? Possibly. If, you know, he explains to you... If you're successful, you will catch the notice, likely, of the Worshipful Company of Mercers, and they probably will make you an offer. It probably will be very attractive, and you could turn a tidy profit. Of course, they generally only make offers towards enterprises that otherwise would have done much better. That is to say, enterprises that have a lot of promise and growth, they offer what it's worth in the moment, but a canny investor would know that in time it'd be worth more. And that's probably exactly why the company of Mercers is making these offers. Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that it's necessarily a bad thing. You could still turn a profit. Thinking on this, I think uh, you know, Robert would hearing that this, uh, this challenge is here, he is looking at at least starting this company, if it's if it doesn't uh, become an equal footing as Mercer's, he still would win out, and his family is sure to see an increase in wealth, which is, is one of his main goals for doing this anyway. So he would take on this this task, and he would even be willing to. Look for the most experienced sailors and make them offers, even if it's a, it comes at a small sacrifice to himself that they get on his ship, or maybe maybe not as much as a profit as he would like to see on his end, but make his uh, offer more lucrative to these sailors. So you wish to cut into... Assuming this is successful, you want to cut into your own profits to pay the sailors more? Yes. With the goal of what? Of having the most experienced sailors, not... Uh, oh, I see. 
Yeah. Hiring more qual paying more for better quality. Exactly. Okay. Well, first you need a successful enterprise. Are you going to head this, or are you going to let Francois take the lead on this? You know for a fact he's far more experienced in this. He has far more experience with this. Um, on the business end, mm -hmm. he'll let Francois take over, especially the the writings of the contracts and everything. But he will keep a very close ear to things that would be in his influence, which mainly would be people. There was people that he needed to speak with to convince them to sign on. Then that is definitely what he would do. And, of course, uh, he'll also take on some of uh, his more local properties under his direct vision so that Francois doesn't have to worry about those as well. Okay. So we'll see how Francois does in negotiating some contracts. He has to make use of some of your funds to make these offers. So we'll see how he does. And while I'm... I'm gonna roll for him to see how he does in, in this startup. And you... For managing your resources during this time I'm going to have you roll your Wits Commerce, difficulty 6, just to maintain them. Okay. Okay, you're definitely able to you know, keep your own affairs in order while this, while Francois works out some of these contracts and trade deals with the, the textiles. All right. I forgot I had my own macros. I just didn't use them. Uh, so, he's successful. It's not an explosion of success, and you can see, you know, with, you know, you have some experience in this, you can see some of the difficulties he's facing in getting some of these people to uh, agree to the numbers. It's a lot of this is bottom line, you know, profit margin, and some of it is supply. Uh, some of these, you know, there's, there's just not that many textiles that haven't already signed on with the worshipful company of mercers so he has to make do with some of the less industrious the you know starting off with smaller smaller looms and textiles uh, you know product sizes and trade sizes which means it's slow going it takes a number of years for this to get going but it does seem to be working for now. Let's see here. So it's now in the 1400s, and it, you hear of another rebellion breaking out at the turn of the century from the Welsh in their last desperate struggle for independence led by a man named Owen Glendweir, the nominal Prince of Wales. And this ensuing conflict would continue to tear apart the western midlands of England as the raids and armies marched back and forth, destroying towns and already fragile economies. And by 1415, Wales is devastated and the rebellion is put down. Oh, and Glindewear having disappeared in one of these last raids. Perhaps just another unfortunate revolt of the economy. Perhaps that's why the Welsh tried to fight for their independence again. Meanwhile, 
your enterprise is slowly growing. Your insistence on having experienced sailors on the ships that you do business on definitely slows the growth of profit more. So you don't see a noticeable increase in your resources, although if things continue as they do, it should become more profitable over time. Uh, is there any change to Robert's plans during this time? He wants to know what uh, the Mercers are offering their men. Like in wages? Yes. So he'll, he'll uh, go to Mercer sailors and get a feel for their situation. How happy they are working with the company. Any complaints? Roll your manipulation empathy, difficulty eight. Are you are you trying to be sneaky about this at all, or do you just kind of go up and start talking to them about how things are going? Hmm. 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 Uh, he's only going to be sneaky in as much as showing an interest in um, joining the Mercers. At least that's what he would tell the sailors. That's about as sneaky as he would go. Okay, so not extremely clandestine. No. Okay. Did you roll your oh, sorry. attempt to talk to them? Not yet. Uh, what was the roll again? Uh, manipulation, Empathy, Difficulty 8. get a few answers from some of these men and they're very reluctant to talk about their business, what they make and you know how they're doing overall you get the impression that they're paid comparable to your experienced sailors even though you think that some of them aren't as experienced so their wages must be fairly good for the times. But you also find that you're not able to inquire very long before you start getting shooed away by the guards and then by some of the sailors themselves who actively avoid talking to you. Okay. Even the guards are keeping an eye, eh? There are guards on these ships who seem hyper-vigilant about people getting in the way. And you talking to them while they're working, you're getting in the way. And they shoo you away. Oh, of course. Um, well, that, that is quite silly. What is a tavern these men frequent? This is, you know, not one instance. It's more like over time, over weeks, you know, you talk to different merchants who are coming in, and uh, let's see, it's the city of Colchester, I think I said, yeah. 
Yeah, I guess I should should have put emphasis that I'm not really trying to get in the way of the men. Like just when they're it's nighttime, they're clearly at a, on a break or relaxing. Yeah, so those are, I mean, that doesn't really change the answer you get, except that when you start talking to them in the taverns, it does seem like you're being watched, and the sailors themselves, when it becomes apparent that you're talking, you're asking them about how things are going, some of the other sailors are actually advocating they don't answer and they kind of, you know, form ranks. They close ranks, I should say. So they're starting to become more withdrawn, especially in the tavern. Mm-hmm. So like even if we're getting answers from, you know, their superiors, other sailors are giving them glares not to talk, and then they they stop talking to you. Okay. I suppose uh Gauthier is coming on too strong. It's clear, um, it's clear to you someone doesn't want them talking. Yeah, yeah. Then rather than... Um, and rather than that, he'll, he'll go up to the tavern owner and ask if he could uh, sing for some money. For what goal? He's going to monitor the crowd and if anyone, because he did put out there that he was looking to, he might be looking to get in on a crew, at least to uh, see what it's like being a sailor. He does look quite young. Mm -hmm. So um, he's going to see if... uh, Anyone's going to break their cold shell, and if he do, if he does, he's going to put extra work using presence on them as well to pry as much as he can. So it's easy enough getting on stage. You know, you schmooze your way up, and you're entertaining, and everyone seems to have a good time. You're a, a you're a very well trained performer, and that's easy enough. After Do the people? Go ahead. Yeah. Do they at least warm up now? I mean, they warm up to you, but if you start talking to them about that, they'll at this point they'll you know get up and leave. Unless you do something supernatural. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Well, now that they're at least warmed up, um, he's going to. Who who looked like they really enjoyed the performance? I mean, they all did. None of them were faking it. They were all pretty, you know, enamored with your performance. You're wonderful. Okay. Okay. That's not the problem. Who's the one initiating the? Uh, Mm-hmm. Everyone backing away and being silent about about this whole ordeal. Several of them. It's not just one. You can tell that. It's almost like this man remembered he was, you know, he remembered something when they started to glare at him, and you know, elbow him in the side. Okay. Okay, okay. Do you want to further pursue this? 
A different manner, I think. Okay. Uh, he's going to collect the money for his performance and head out the tavern. And um, see if he can get someone alone. And he's going to turn uh, presence up on that one person. And he's going to go out at, at not not just asking questions, but he's he's going to go at the order of why is everyone being so uh, distant? You notice that after you started asking questions, they became very vigilant of each other and very reluctant to you know, separate, especially when uh, they see you come back or you're, you're on the streets again. It's very difficult to isolate one of them now. You know, unless you start killing some people. <laughs> so, after leaving the tavern, like, they never leave. And if they do, it's all, all in a big group. They leave the tavern and go back to the ship as a group. Okay. That's more what I was wondering. How long? Are, how I mean, in general, how long are you going to persist on this and perseverate on getting an answer? He's not going to spend um, more than, let's say, uh, he's not going to like come here month after month. He's just going to be here for, at the most, at the most, let's say, uh, a week trying to get information out of these men. Okay. Then yeah, I'm gonna say it's it's pretty much the same crew right now on this week. You know, they're harbored now and they're gonna leave again for the next shipment. So Okay, so it's all the whole crew. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, you find it's very difficult getting answers. There's definitely some kind of some kind of code or agreement that they're not supposed to talk about what what's going on to outsiders, especially if they're inquiring about it. You get that impression strongly. All right, then. So, as the group's leaving the tavern, the first time they do, he's going to use awe and try to get the whole group's attention on him. Okay, you succeed. They're just mortals. And he's just going to flat out say, what do I need to do to be a sailor? They tell you to get on a boat. With the Mercer Company. They suggest talking to the captain. Oh, where is the captain? On the ship. In that case, he'll, uh, he'll thank the men and head out ahead of them towards the captain. Sure. You know which ship they're on and everything, so you make your way on. You talk to the captain, who's a bit surprised to see you back here. And uh, there are some guards nearby, but he lets you speak. What do you tell him? Assuming he's never spoken with the captain yet, right? Correct. Um, I 
Is this captain, uh... He's gonna ask the captain, uh... He's gonna, he's gonna play this, um... Innocently. He's gonna ask the... Or, well, maybe not innocent, but... It, yeah, you know, I'm like... Knowing, knowing nothing. Is he the owner of the Mercer Company? He's gonna ask the captain that. And see what he says. He just laughs at you. And tells you to get off his ship. And then he's going to try and sell that... He can be, uh, I'm sh he's sure he could be a great sailor. He tells you they have a full crew. But if you're dead set on sailing, you could talk to this outpost back in Colchester, representative of the Company of Mercers. They might have an idea of where you could get on a ship. Okay. In that case, he'll, he'll thank the captain for his time and head off, because he's not getting anything else here. And in due time, you arrange for a meeting. It's difficult meeting with this man in the evening, but eventually you meet with one, one of these officers in this guild. And what do you tell them or ask them? How private is this meeting? It's private, just you and them. Okay. And a couple of guards. All right then, so, of course, using a gracious amount of awe, he's going to, uh, ask, uh, how the procedure works. Does he, to get on a crew, or do they just buy up ships, stuff like that? It's explained to you that the company of Mercers uses a wide array of strategies to improve its profits. It's a very vague answer. Mm -hmm. Buying up ships is one of those. So, would I need to find a ship to get on a crew, or are there, are there any crews open right now? The officer tells you about a crew in London that could use another you know, labor sailor. How much does that pay? You get a quote for a pretty good pay for a sailor of the time. Better than what you're offering. Indeed. That sounds very tempting. If I did go down to London, uh, would this would this slot be filled by the time I get down there? No way of knowing. If you ride fast, you might get there. Can't tell the future. Is there someone's name I should know, or do I just go to random ships? 
uh, the officer directs you to another outpost similar to this one, kind of like a trading office or representative office for the Company of Mercers, and that, you know, local ports and administration would be handled from the London office. They would have more up-to-date information. I'll certainly thank the man for uh, his, the information and uh, listen if he has anything else to say for someone that's looking to make sailing their life before he heads out. If he doesn't. Yeah, not really. You're allowed to leave. Do you go to London now? No, no. <laughs> At least he has like a good picture in... Uh, the pay that's that comes with this for even a starting laborer and how much more is it than what he's paying not significantly okay it's definitely competitive competitive in broad strokes what are your plans now broad strokes he's going to want to think of a way to make his business more attractive and even me as a player right now I'm struggling right now to think uh, of something that's kind of the point you realize um, have, have, as you reflect on it you realize they're they're a few steps ahead they have the resources to pay their men even new hires better than you can pay your seasoned sailors they seem to have a pretty tight hierarchy they're very organized and they seem to only be expanding even with uh you know, you're relatively new to this game, but you can tell this is going to be an uphill battle, if not a losing battle. Seems so. Another 15 years pass as business, as your enterprise continues to progress, and we're going to see how Francois does. He's still trying to increase things here. He's very successful over these next 15 years. He finds, uh, he finds a lot of new recruits. He manages to get some very good deals on new cogs, you know, shipwrights that are just starting out. And he, he's there at the right place, you know, right place, right time. He gets some really good contracts, and you can add a dot of resources to your character sheet with his success. Huzzah! But I also need you to roll for maintaining your own resources during this time, since he's okay. not doing it. It was wit resources, right? Uh, it was wits. Com or commerce. Yeah, commerce. Commerce. Or wits and commerce, okay. Mm -hmm. Standard difficulty. Unfortunately, you are a bit overwhelmed by your own estates and your own finances you realize you're stretched a bit too thin especially with this new enterprise you're kind of trying to keep track on and you find that although Francois is successful in garnering new business through this textile enterprise you end up uh, 
a bit more in the expenditure than the income and because of some losses you will be losing the dot of resources Robert's disappointed, but that is what it is. He needs to, he realizes he needs to redouble his efforts on his current properties. The Hundred Years' War, meanwhile, is going very poorly for England in these latter years as battles and provinces are lost to the French who have now developed a professional standing army and robust use of the cannon, which is now appearing even on the refitted cogs alongside the archers and crossbowmen. And you hear that the greatest English general, John Talbot, the Earl of Shrewsbury, is finally killed near Bordeaux at the Battle of Castillon. And with his death, it signals the, the loss of the Hundred Years' War as control over Aquitaine goes to the French, and it comes to a dark close with the French V. And as the war ends, veterans return to a battered and bitter England, where now a highly corrupt circle of dukes and earls surround the weak and ineffectual King Henry VI, the group led by his wife, Queen Margaret of Anjou. You also receive an offer for your textile trading enterprise by none other than the Worshipful Company of Mercers. Also, go ahead and get uh, take another dot of commerce for all of your work here. Okay. Scanning the offer, how uh, lucrative is it? You and Francois both go over it, and between the two of you, you both come to the same conclusion. It is about what the De Veres, your descendants, told you. It appears to be the value of your enterprise, not significantly more, You'd mostly be liquidating what you have to make a lot of silver and gold. You would no longer have the income, you would just have the coin for what it's worth. But it would not be an increase in your resources by any means. Hmm. Uh, since um, since uh, my family was partner to this, they've uh, they've increased their wealth thus far. Correct? They have. Yes, okay. alongside okay. you. Good, okay. He's going to... Uh... He's going to speak with the sailors of their own ship and see how the seas have been faring for them in the trade. They report trade has been good. It's steady. It's good work. It's the best work that most of them can find during this time. Some of them are veteran sailors from the Hundred Years' War. They used to be on warships, and now they're on trade ships, and they're happy with their lot. Good. How about the captain? Does he seem uh, does he seem like he's 
Like it's just uh, another job, or does he have any actual real uh, drive behind him? The captain of the ship is, you know, he's about as passionate as any trade captain, trade ship captain, which is to say, not extremely. You know, it's mostly about coin. It's about making a livelihood. You hear he's got a family he's trying to support. He never sees, but it's good pay, and much like the sailors, he's happy with how things are. And the offer made to you is basically to keep all these men employed, but that all of their contracts would be to the worshipful company, that they'd be paying these men, and that all the trade goods would go to them, basically to take it all off your hands for a lump sum of, of silver and gold. And is, is textiles indeed the only thing that's in boom right now? Nothing else? Lots of things are in boom right now, but textiles are the the hottest trend right now, especially for England. Tin and iron and lead, like I said, are definitely profitable enterprises, but trade of textiles is on everyone's mind. Since men have come back from the war how has uh, labor overall been the labor supply is not very good a significant portion of both France's and England's uh, workforce really population um, was wiped out. France lost half of its population. England lost a third of its population. A lot of that was to plague. Some of it was to war. Agriculture certainly is not going to be coming back anytime soon. And the textiles from the trade, what have they been going to? Have they just been That's sold to... Yeah, they're exports, mostly exports, to the mainland. Okay. okay, they're exports, okay. Hmm. <laughs> so you have this offer... I do have this offer, and I know that they're going to become more aggressive. So the question is, do I relent and collect and maybe go into something else or continue with this? That's the question. I'll have you roll something. Make a wits investigation, difficulty seven. Are you maintaining any contact with any canites during this time? <laughs> like your sire, your grandsire, mm -hmm. or anyone? Anyone in New York? I haven't thought about that. We could say... We could say um, he's sent a letter to his grandsire. And I'm assuming his grandsire is more in contact with Killian than he himself is. So, um, he just sent a letter letting him know what he's up, where he's at. Um, having a go at the Merchant Enterprise on his own. And just to let him know if anything comes up. Alright, you receive a letter back from your grandsire when you inform him that you've undertaken an enterprise into the textile business and he warns you that there is a guild called the Worshipful Company of Mercers that he should be aware of 
It's basically telling you things you already know, but he also mentions that there are a number of Cainites who have tried to start some of these ventures, much like you, and when they rejected their offers, they began to lose resources, they began to lose funds because things started happening quickly that very significantly impacted their business. They lost contracts within a year or two and it, it became highly unprofitable. Their business became a burden, an economic burden, after they, after they rejected the offer. Yeah, that's where that's where Robert's mind was leaning hearing the previous warnings and having that come from another source just further makes it firm. He's going to accept this deal, sell this this uh this cruise contracts over to the Mercer company and take the money and look for something local, something he could have more influence in. Okay. The purchase takes time. It's a significant undertaking to uh, move all these contracts, but you do eventually end up with a large chest of silver and gold coins. Where do you put that? I suppose he doesn't have a, a manor now. That no, the manor you were in burned down, and because of financial troubles a couple decades ago, you had to sell off some of your Essex estates to settle some debts. In theory, you could go back to Lincoln. Your grandsire seemed quite accommodating for now. You do have your domain there, you just don't, your haven is burned down. Okay. How much of this gold could go towards reconstruction? Or would it consume it all? Would there be anything left, or would it not be enough? Well, it depends on how grand a haven you want to make. If you want to build a castle, it's going to use it up. And the other one wasn't a castle, so how no. much would a manor be? You would have to... It wouldn't be the manner the size you were in if you used up... If you wanted to keep your resources without, you know, losing some of it. Uh, let's see. Roll your resources, difficulty 8. Okay. Yeah, you're not going to have the coin to put together the manor you used to have. You could do a smaller one, more like a two-story house. Two-story house? Hmm. That would not do for... Let's see, Francois said lo logistics became difficult with the loss of the manor, right? Yeah, it became a little bit of a challenge when he was trying to run your finances after your manor was gone because there were some documents in there and such. Okay, that's that's the problem. Okay. Mm-hmm. Then instead of just directly going for a manor, which just sounds like it would be a money sink, 
Um, he'll he'll head back to Lincoln. Okay. And let's see. What was the main trade over in Lincoln? Or what were the trades? Let me look. There's rich agriculture. They trade as well in textiles. They have a small amount of trade in woolen goods. It's not what it was. They also have a mint there for minting coins. So they have a couple mines. Okay. It's clay lowlands. There's mines there as well. What does Francois think would be profitable to start in Lincoln? In Lincoln. He laughs kind of regrettably. It's one of the few times you do see or hear him laugh. He's such a dour man. He tells you that if this hadn't all happened, he would have told you textiles. That being the case, since that's kind of run its course, he would suggest something more niche. But as he's kind of, you know, you're talking about this with him, and he tells you that a company like the company of Mercers, I mean, you would know this being being as, as knowledgeable as you have become of the business. There are guilds for different domains. There's a guild for, there was a guild for textiles, the Drapers. They were more or less made insignificant, almost pointless, because most of their contracts got taken by the Company of Mercers. The Company of Mercers is an all-encompassing charter trading company. There's nothing they don't get into. And he suspects, given what he saw, what he experienced with you, and knowing that their domain is virtually limitless, if you made something promising, something enterprising with growth and potential to become very profitable, they would come back. And they would take that too. That encompassing, wow. The company of Mercers has absorbed several guilds and has no real delineage of what they won't trade in. They're traders, they're merchants. Which is where the word Mercer kind of comes from. Except that they're more organized and more unionized than has previously been seen in past centuries. There's no telling where they're going to stop if they will stop. So noted. And he tells you that in, you know, he's your ghoul. He doesn't want you to spend more time and heartache and money on something that's going to get swallowed again. You'll thank Francois for his advice. And... Rather than going too much further in, um, into, I guess, trade as it is, 
He'll have to probably look towards... Regaining what he lost in his own blunders. Is is that even possible? Well, between the fire and what you had to sell off to settle your debts... It's not impossible, it's just kind of how you want to go about it. And the company of Mercers is making things extremely difficult. Of course, there are, you know, a number of other unconventional ways. You could become a, prof a professional performance artist. You could become a mercenary. You could do all kinds of things, in theory, to make money. It just seems that trade, specifically, is one of the biggest ventures to get into, and it's also one of the hardest ones right now. If you're not the company of mercers. Okay. Okay. So, yes and no. Meanwhile, as this is going on, you heard that in the 1430s there was some disturbing reports of Canite guests running across Ireland making some raid on Dublin, but without any more direct sources to confirm it's little more than rumor, although it's an alarming one, you know, between your visits to cities, you hear the Canites talk about their concern about these anarchists and if they'll reach mainland, they'll reach England, and what, what would happen. It's just kind of the, you know, the chatter. Hmm. He'll he'll go see his grandsire and see, see how things are going. Absolutely. You return to Lincoln and meet your sire. Do you tell him about what happened with your business and all that? Yeah, he'll tell him that he took his advice and decided to just sell it rather than get into a losing battle. He seems to nod sagely at that, kind of looking past you and in thought. He'll, he'll actually mention... Um, him and that other gentleman. Dayton de Corvo? Yes. Have they been getting into similar ventures and ran into the Mercers? He just smiles and deflects the question. Although... You've known him now long enough that you can tell when he's telling you something without telling you something. And you get the impression that maybe perhaps something similar has happened or is happening. It's definitely... It's definitely something on his mind. He offers... He'll... Go ahead. He'll just, just make a remark. Ah, uh, they've caused so much annoyance. I wish I could just put them out of business. Oh, uh, go ahead. For his part, he does. When you return, he offers to. Uh, help you uh, restore a manor within your domain. He seems to be doing fine enough in his funds and you know, your domain is still intact but there's no haven there. Robert will look surprised and graciously thank him for this offer and take him up on that. Time passes on another 10 or so years. Is. Does Robert mean to do anything else in particular now that he's kind of back in Lincoln? Uh, 
What's the year? It's it's between 1430 and 1450, so it's in that kind of time time frame of 10 to 20 years. Okay. I'm keeping it kind of vague and open. I just want to give you a chance in case there's anything you really want to do in, in Lincoln. Well, since there's not much of economic worth out here, uh, his alias it, oof, does it mean anything to nobility, or is it a common name? Well, I, I assume it's not common. I'm sure. I'm assuming there's no last names in the Middle Ages, anyway. Is there? Yeah, Lacan. I mean, it's it's kind of like a family name, right? Um, yeah. But by this point, it's been, I think, 60 years. Let's see, 1390. I think it was around 1380 that you burned, had to have that burned down. But yeah, it's been about 60 years. Most of the people who were around during that time have died, virtually all of them. And while the name might be familiar at very very likely you know it's it's a family name that's known the Devere's uh, especially more in Essex than in Lincoln but some people might recognize it no one recognize you so you could take up your name again if you so chose okay Perhaps he'll just keep this identity in his back pocket, but for now he'll let's switch back to being yeah. called by his own name. He feels like he's lived long enough in these long years of challenge. On that note, you can add a dot of alternate identity as Gautier Lacan, usable in York. Okay. People know you there. Kind know you there. Although, that'll become less relevant the longer we get out, because it's been a little while. So now people will start to think Gautier Lacan is dead. But if you wanted to masquerade as someone besides yourself, you could get away with it, with the, you know, a little bit of raising the hood and you know, hiding your face a little bit. You can get by as that cloaked Gautier. Okay. He'll send a letter to Ragnar just asking how... How what? How things are going. Ragnar replies that things could be better. She's very vague in her letter, but... It seems cautious. The language seems as though she's concerned about something that gives her anxiety and that she is glad to have a letter from a... not really a friend, but at least an acquaintance that did not anger her. It's fairly formal overall. But, if anything, on the positive end of that, that, that spectrum, if that helps. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you know, if you write somebody you kind of knew, and, you know, they're pleased to hear from you, but they're not best friends or anything. Yeah. So, these, um, these Anarch vampires, how close are they to York? You only heard the rumor that they were in Ireland, that they raided Dublin. Um, actually, go ahead and do, um... Yeah, what's investigation? Difficulty 6. You asking around about this? Sure, because this sounds like something big that's starting. Yeah. What's investigation at 6? Alright, because you're asking around, 
you do pick up on something. Uh, you're in Lincoln, so let's see here. Who would be most likely? Actually, I think your sire, Killian, he's in town when you were asking about this, and he travels a lot, so he hears a lot. And he talks to you about some of what he's heard. He went west, and he was visiting the uh, Prince and Exter uh, near Cornwall, the county of Cornwall out in the west. And apparently there was a big, there was a great battle, at least for Canites. Some of these Anarchs were spotted making landfall on the coast of Cornwall, and they were hunted down by Canites from Ireland. And no one's sure what all happened or who all was involved, but the name... Cormac de Corsi comes up as somebody of significance in eradicating this. And they're not sure if they if all of them are gone, but the Canites of Exter were very alarmed that these Anarchs had come so close that they're making landfall after the reports they heard in Dublin. That's what Killian tells you. Alright. So, for the next year, he's going to um, focus on his manor uh, and getting um, getting servants, loyal servants that could potentially turn into herd. Absolutely. I'll have you. Let's see. I mean, if you're if you're just gonna pay them, that's not difficult. I would just have. Yeah. You... Yes. Yes, yeah, that gold, I suppose. Yeah, you've got plenty of coin, and you're spending time on it. You're not, you know, splurging on anything crazy. So if you spend the next year on it, I'll let you add a dot of herd. Actually, I have an idea. Roll your resources to standard difficulty. Your successes will be in how much you hire, and that can be in your herd. Okay. Whoop whoop. Yeah, you gain reliable staff and a few of them. You can add three to your herd. You're very successful in luring people in. And you're a very charming person, so it makes sense. People want to work for you, even if they, even if they don't get paid quite as well as they could. Uh, you're easier to work for, you're a nicer person to work for, and you're charming. Aw, oh, gushing. Um, he'll go see if, uh, well, how, long, how long would a trip to York take? Excellent question. Something I researched. Oh. Let's see. Travel from Lincoln to York. It's going to be. So it's 425 miles from Edinburgh to the Isle of Wight. And that's kind of the expanse of mainland England going up into Scotland. Let me just do really rough. Some really rough calculations here. So half that distance would be 200-ish. I'm gonna say it's around 75 miles. And are you riding yourself? Are you taking any people with you? Taking a herd with you or servants? He'll leave them to maintain the manor um, yeah he'll leave his herd behind to maintain the manor and he'll ride alone okay so I'm gonna say the real challenge for you is that you can't ride during the day and you have to have a plan for during the day 
which makes logistics a little bit difficult. So I'm going to say if you're going alone, you have no planned cover, you can go 15 miles a day. So about five, five days, close to a week. It takes you about a week to get from Lincoln to York on horseback. So you can't travel during the day, you have to travel at night. You have to find places to hide during the day, places to keep your horse. Logistically, it's harder for vampires than it is for people. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, about a week, a little bit less. He, okay, then. Uh, so he'll take a week off from uh, the manor to let his servants know that he'll he's leaving and he plans on returning in about maybe uh, at the most a month. They note it. And he'll... He'll head back to York. Say hello to Ragna. Um, if he's not going to express it, you know, if she's not going to stop him, he'll, um, he'll head over to that bookshop and see if that man is still alive there. Do you intend to keep up good relations with Ragna over this time period? Like beyond this visit? He does. He doesn't see any reason why he would. Okay. Roll your... Uh, hmm. Hmm. Through visits or letters? In this case... Not, hmm. You know, beyond this one visit, over yeah, time. Yeah, beyond, beyond this, yeah. yeah. Because that changes the outcome. Mm-hmm. Hmm, I'm thinking. <laughs> sure, sure, he'll, um... Maybe during, uh... During a summer, the summer months, he would come down to York and uh, mingle with the... Uh, the kindred down there. Yeah, going in Especially person. Especially Ragna. Is, uh, going in person helps a lot. Roll your charisma, empathy, standard difficulty. Oof. Oh, yeah, you're wildly popular. And, you know, normally an elder like this wouldn't really waste their time on an Ancilla, but you're particularly charming. You have connections with the Prince of Lincoln, and so it puts you at a cut above other neonates in Ancilla that she wouldn't really waste her time on otherwise. And with that foot in the door, you add in your charm, and you're, you're really good at talking and socializing. So even, you know, an elder that's kind of aloof like Ragna, uh, she seems to appreciate your visits, and you, you know, even beyond her, the Canines of York seem to grow fond of you, and I'll give you a, let me think what's most appropriate. I don't know if there's a background that's really appropriate here. Maybe kind of like status? I was thinking about status. It's not, in a, it's not a position of authority, but go ahead and put, get, you, you can, to mark this down somewhere, take a dot of status to represent specifically your improved relations with Ragna and the Canines of York especially. All right. You're definitely very popular there. And um, your bookseller man is dead by now. But it's been taken over by another bookseller. Hmm. He'll mourn the passing of uh, the old bookseller and speak to the new bookseller about him a little bit. Being vague, but um, how does this new bookseller seem? 
He's less friendly than the other one. He wants to know if you're going to buy anything. He's more interested in money, in the bottom line. And when he finds out you're just here to talk, he kind of gets annoyed. He didn't seem to care much about the memory of the other. He had a name, and his name is going to be remembered. <laughs> Albert Duran. He didn't seem to care much about Albert, but you remember him. Even as the world forgets Albert Duran, you remember him. And he does. So this new guy is a lot more demanding. He's a lot more curt. You want? He's more about business than, you know, sharing philosophy and poetry. And education. He wants to be paid for his expertise. Hmm. And how are the profits for this bookstore? He would inquire. Not very good. It's mostly eccentric nobles who have money to spend, so they buy tomes. Occasionally, they actually he. He does report being a little bit unnerved by a singular customer who frequently comes only in the evenings, and she puts him off quite a bit. Uh, he kind of laments to you. Otherwise, it's not very profitable. Do you think if you had more funding, you could do more, or is that just the times? It's kind of the times. It's, you know, bookstores are, you have to be very rich to actually buy a book. And it's, you know, occasionally the clergy will come by because they have the coin. But uh, otherwise, it's a lot of private collectors or particularly wealthy merchants who have an interest in these things or this strange woman who seems to have money to spend to keep the conversation going ask for the latest uh, works that are out and he'll, he'll choose one to purchase and ask more on this lady more works in the realm of what? Like, uh, poetry? Yes, poetry. Okay. Give me one moment. He recommends works by John Audley, an English priest and poet from Shropshire. He has some of his texts. And he'll take those. Yeah, he'll, he'll purchase them. He seems to perk up a bit when you actually spend coin there. And then he'll talk more about this, this woman who unnerves him. She's a very pale complexion and seems to look only for any new texts that he has on either theology, death, or the occult. Considering the kindred he's met out here, does that sound like anyone he knows? It certainly does sound like a Cainite, but and you would be popular, you would be well enough in the know of York to know who is here. This is one of the very few cities that still harbors Tremere. And there is a Chantry in the city. And there is a woman 
that is said to be the regent, the head of the Chantry, named Eve Cavanon. It could be her. Although she's not the one to frequent Elysium or really attend court unless necessary. You've seen her once. Okay, okay. And she typically comes by for theology. What else? And any books that study death, theories on the afterlife and the odd occult text that the clergy has not already burned or taken for themselves, which makes it slim pickings indeed. Hmm. I guess one last thing I'll ask the supply or the bookstore owner. Who does he usually get his supply from? There's no real reliable source. There are traders who come in to the port near York. Let me see if it actually has a name. I'm blanking on the name. It might just be the port of York. Yeah, it's a port city and trade hub on the river Ouse. So sometimes traders come in and, you know, the merchants there will come by and they'll sell him books, otherwise traveling bands of merchants. He doesn't have a good source. Occasionally the clergy, I think the clergy is probably his main source of text and books that they're producing. So there's a lot of theology and law in here. Okay. Okay, so thank the shopkeep and leave. Um, and he'll head over towards the Chantry and see if Eve is there. You don't know where the Chantry is. No one does. Ah. Aha. Especially since the news of London, which is really only a century ago, is fresh in the mind of most of the Canites here, no Tremere is very willing to say where they live or sleep. It's certainly not where their chantry is. Hmm. Somewhat wonder if there's a way to track her down. I'm sure there is. Yeah, like waiting outside the bookstore. <laughs> no, not doing that. Hmm. Outside the bookstore, are there like any any homeless or any orphans or anything like that? No, the bookstore is in a relatively upscale part of town where some of the higher end merchants are. It's very it's very niche, very uh, boutique level. Makes sense. All right, never mind there then. I'm not even sure how that would turn out. Okay. Sure. It's always merchants. Mm hmm. Or the clergy. Is there a monastery 
near York? There are plenty of churches. Do you mean specifically like a lone building for monks who do yes. not? I'm going to say yes because I'd be hard pressed to believe that there were not. Let me see if actually anything comes up in my research. Much of the land of Yorkshire, the county, is rugged and inhospitable. So that means much of the settlement is concentrated. And the isolation does lead to religious orders establishing houses across the county, such as the Cistercian Abbey of Riveau and Fountains and the Benedictine Abbey of Whitby. And the cathedral, the minster of St. Peter, dominates the city. It's actually well known across Europe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to the west is the Benedictine St. Mary's Abbey and the leper, leper hospital of St. Leonard's. Leper hospital, huh? Mm-hmm. Yeah, since he has, since he's visiting for uh, a month or so, he'll he'll head down there and ask if a lady who looks like that has been there looking for material at the leper hospital. Yeah, sure. I roll your perception investigation. Standard difficulty. No, no one here has heard of or seen anybody like that. They have a lot of nuns, a lot of sisters, a lot of clergy working with the lepers, giving out alms, taking care of the sick. But no one like the woman you're describing. Uh, before he leaves, he'll, it's probably in vain, but I'll just ask if there's any scribe work done here. Any scribe work? Yeah. Like, are there any texts done at the Leper Hospital? <laughs> yeah. I, I know, it's in vain. Not particularly. This is really more about caring for the sick. Okay. And then he'll just leave to the next one. I think the Benedictine. Yeah. There are, as I said, there are a number of religious uh, institutions. What is his goal overall in going from uh, to the one to the next? Well, on one hand, he wants to know if uh, if Eve, which is he's, he's guessing it's Eve, is traveling to these places looking for texts the bookseller may not have. Another way is just to just to uh, get a look at maybe classical text. It's dawned on him there's probably classical poetry. Somewhere in uh, a monastery. None of these places seem to be reporting anybody by that description, the description you give of Yves Cavanon. Mm -hmm. You do find a number of, you know, texts that you're able to, You know, with a bit of talking, you know, I'm not going to make you roll because you're a really charming person. But uh, you're able to get to these texts. The problem is some of these, some of these churches are hard to enter. You find they make you uncomfortable. Some are actually make you. It's painful to enter. Some of them, huh? Some, not all. Some are easier to get into than others, and you know, nothing is. Nothing actually like burns you per se, but. These are not pleasant places for you to stay around in. So noted. Is he able to notice what... Or was it ever explained to him? 
you're old enough now to have heard, especially after your manor burned down, your grandsire explained to you, you know, the concern for hunters, for witch hunters and vampire hunters, which are a very real threat to your kind, and that they are on the rise, that London faced a number of them, and there's a theory that they operate out of Canterbury. Some say that that's, you know, unlikely with the Prince of Canterbury there. But there are cells, and you've heard of things about faith, so you do know that there's there are other powers in this world beyond Canites and even beyond the Lupines, which, which even the Canites should fear. Okay. So, generally unpleasant experience. Mm -hmm. have, have they yielded any um, any actual text that he could look at? Perhaps even purchase if they were so inclined to sell them? I'm going to say yes, because that's a lot of what they do, especially if you ask about it and request it. They do have some scribes who, you know, it takes some time, but since you're there for a couple months, they have the time to put some of this together, and you do get a few hand-scribed uh, transcriptions of some of these texts of religious poetry and, and other texts such as that, which you find to your liking. <laughs> You have to be careful about how many you buy at once. These are expensive. They're very precious. Every word, every color that was painted on, it's... It's, uh, love... It's... It, there's... There's a lot of... It's painstakingly made. That's what I'm trying to say. Each one. Every page. Yes. He'll buy um, what money allows because he's not really buying much right now. Um, he's definitely yeah, he's definitely tightening his budget. He, has, he hasn't been throwing as many priorities because he's separated from. Uh, he's, he's very much distanced himself from people, which upon realizing this, maybe he's going to head back home, make more of an effort for another. Another uh, 10 or 20 years. All right. So, yeah, in between your, I could say, in between your visits to York and befriending many of the people there and befriending Prince Ragna, you can spend some time improving your status in Lincoln, which I won't make another roll for. It. Um, especially since you're a known quantity, you have to get over some of your initial faux pas, but your connection to the prince gives you a lot of leeway, and time spent there definitely improves your standing in, in the city. And by 1454, as time has raced on, the Covenant has now held control over England for nearly a century with the gauntlet enforcing its will until you hear of its complete destruction in March of that year. One and all, the gauntlet is gone, having died in, it sounds like a fire or some kind of assault, on the estate of Gaetan de Corriveau. For several weeks after, there is a flurry of activity. Messengers ride here and there, hastily delivering messages, trying to make sense of what's happened and what is happening now and what will happen afterwards. Your sire during this time, he returns and stays for some time in Lincoln, expecting calamity to strike. Your grandsire, on the other hand, is rarely seen during this time. He's stowed away in his tower with his ghoul, Reynald. What does Robert make of this? 
Alone? Gauthier is not, uh, is not with him? The grandsire? Reynald is with him. No, 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 the, uh, the merchant he was working with, Gauthier, or Gauthier? Oh, wait, no, 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 sorry, 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 I'm looking at the wrong... Yeah, you're Gaetan. good, you're good Gaetan. Gaetan. Yeah, yeah, Gaetan. Gaetan is dead. He died in the fire with the entire gauntlet. Oh, no. Well, um... Yeah, um, during the time he's able to catch up with his sire, he'll definitely do so. Maybe offer to sing, uh, sing some more songs over nostalgia if he seems amendable to that. But otherwise, he's going to go check on his grandsire. Your sire, Killian, accepts your invitation, and uh, the two of you perform together for Elysium. And it's it's something of a somber affair, but it's definitely appreciated that the two of you take the time to perform. It it certainly distracts the other Canites from this calamity. In a hundred years, nothing like this has happened. Not since the peace, not since the stability of the covenant has come. Did anyone think this would, this could happen? And. Having a distraction like this is is well very welcome. Your grandsire doesn't see anyone. He doesn't let anyone in for weeks. He gets messengers, but otherwise no one leaves. He doesn't leave. You never see Reynald, his, his ghoul, leave. But finally, you do receive an invitation to his chambers alone, hearing that he wishes to speak to you. I'll head inside to speak. Eager to speak with his grandsire once again. So you return to the chamber at the top of the tower, the long hanging black and blue silks dancing with the current of wind flowing through the large open windows that he has. You can see Reynald is in the room, standing in the back by the windowsill as your, your grandsire is there beside him, looking out the window into the night in the city below. Stepping inside, Robert will Read the air of the atmosphere. It's very somber, and you know that both of them know you're there. And after a few moments, your grandsire does speak up. We vault plagues the streets, and arcs rampage the countryside. Get on. Get on is gone. And the Covenant is under attack. And the England we have worked to create is at risk of crumbling. Tell me, young Robert, if you were me, what would you do? Interesting. <sighs> That is, uh, quite the question. So far, I've just been taking life slowly, collecting, learning. Under direct attack, I suppose I just simply sold my venture and moved on with other things but I suspect this isn't one of those situations
The time has come for a new gauntlet to be formed. We each share to name several nominations at the next council. And I find there are few names being suggested to me which I trust. He turns away from the window to you. But I trust you, Robert. Robert slightly bows his head at that. I thank you, Grandsire. I suspect I'm the top of this list, but I do not know what is required. He takes a few steps further into the room, closer to you. Different princes will say different things. My advisor, Hugo, he has advised someone I believe will do well for his qualities. I am sure the other princes, they have their own nominations in mind. You are someone I trust, and that is more valuable than any asset or skill. If this gauntlet is to succeed, it must be wieldable. It must be something made of those who will see England secure. And I quite would like to see England secure. You are very popular in New York, I have heard from Prince Ragnar. It is good. You do well. He kind of raises his hand to you, gesturing up. That is a very useful skill to win the hearts and souls of others. And I am sure the gun that could use. Robert smiles at this. Thank you for your words. Gaetan is passing is unfortunate to say the least. His what happened fades. to him? Go ahead. Sorry. His smile fades at the mention of Gaetan. He grows very serious and, and sober. I don't know. His mouth opens again as if to speak, but nothing comes out. It will be the highest priority when the gauntlet is assembled to find out what happened to the first gauntlet. To find out what happened to Gaetan. For surely, there is a dark mind behind these things. It did not happen by chance. We will find who did this thing to my Gaetan, to the gauntlet. And we will crush them. Robert nods at this. And you would agree, then, to the nomination. It looks up to you. You do not have to twist my arm to do this. The green You've helped me in the past, and I owe it to you to return. He smiles, nodding to you. You will hear of the decision very soon. See that your affairs are in order. If I have my way, you will become very busy very soon. So be it. 
Time to shake the shackles of hedonism for a bit. He turns away from you to return to the window. The scene fades out. True to his word, a fortnight later you do hear that you have been summoned by the Covenant to the county of Wiltshire. To the town of Salisbury. And it is there we will pick up with the group session and we will pause here and continue.